Uh, hello, everybody. Um, I'm here to talk about uh, Uber and the threat it poses to the traditional taxi industry. But before I get started, I just want to ask, I want to survey the audience. How many people here in the audience, within recent memory, were in a taxi, a City of Toronto taxi, whose driver drove recklessly? Okay, quite a lot. Uh, how many were in a taxi that smelled bad? Okay, not quite as many. How many were in a City of Toronto taxi uh, where the driver wouldn't stop talking on his or her cell phone even though it's completely illegal? Wow, okay, so a lot of people. All right, so the people who just raised their hand, you are the reason that Uber does not have to advertise on television. Because every story you have in your mind when you raise your hand is the advertisement that Uber gives to the world saying, here's why we need Uber. Now, customer service is a problem in every industry. If you go to a restaurant and you get a bad meal, you're not going to go back to the restaurant. If you go to a store and you get bad customer service, you're not going to back, go back to the store. Taxi service has been different, and it's been different since its creation in the light, late 19th century because it's a monopoly. One of the reasons people hate monopolies is if they get bad customer service, they grumble, but they have to go back to it. You tell your story about how the cab smelled, but then when you need single car transportation, you're calling that number and it's a lottery. Maybe the same guy, maybe a car that smells even worse, and you hate it. It's the same reason we complain about healthcare. It's a single payer system, it's a monopoly, and we love cursing monopolies. Uber offers people control. I order a car on Uber, I see a picture of the fellow who's gonna pick me up, I know what kind of car it is, I know how long it's gonna take. I see a little cartoon image of the car coming to pick me up, which I find strangely addictive. I'll watch it for four or five minutes. <laughs> I say, I'm in control of this situation. The guy's three minutes away. But it gives me the illusion of control and I love it. The best part of the control is that if the trip is no good, and I have been on bad Uber rides, I have the control of being able to rate this person on a five star system. And I've rated people one star and I don't feel bad about it because that person shouldn't be driving for Uber. And then I get a very nice message from Uber headquarters. Thank you for letting us know. Thank you for going into great detail about how the car smelled. We are gonna notify this driver. And it gives me the feeling of control. People also get social control. As part of my research for the story that appears on the cover of the magazine that was on your seat, I drove for Uber. I drove for Uber X. It's the one that any schlub can drive for. 16 minute video for your training. That's, that's all it takes. It literally is a 60 minute video. At least 10 minutes of it is about controlling smells in your car. It's a big deal for a bit. <laughs> so I drove for Uber and what I found, it's a very interesting sociological phenomenon because I'm an old person, I'm 47. 20 year olds would get in my car, they would be listening to the music, they'd be listening to the cell phone call. They wouldn't even acknowledge my presence because they've already told me where they're gonna go. They don't need to pay me at the end. Everything is mediated by technology. They would not take their earphones off during the entire trip. There was just some old guy driving them. We'd have no interaction at all. They were staring at their iPhone the whole time. They were in total social control of their experience. This is very important for young people. Total social control. And that's why they love it. And that's why you're reading so many articles about how great Uber is. All right. So everything I've just told you, I think it's taken me about three, three and a half minutes, half my speech. That is the case for Uber, right? You've all read 100 articles about how great Uber is. They've all been written by those 20 year olds. Uh, the young people in particular like it. It's new, it's shiny, it's cheaper. It's 20 or 30% cheaper. Why wouldn't we love it? As with many cover stories, The Walrus Runs, our inquiry begins at the end of where the other articles laid to rest the question. So I wanted to answer the question, okay, let's say the utopians are right. Let's say it doesn't matter what happens to the legacy taxi industry if Uber wipes it out because Uber is superior, Uber is newer, and Uber is shinier. I wanted to answer the question, what's going to happen to our society if the taxi industry as we know it goes extinct and is replaced by part-timers in Uber? So I took the City of Toronto taxi course, which was completely the opposite experience to Uber. Uber, I had 16 minutes of training. City of Toronto, I had 16 days of training. And the City of Toronto taxi course, which you can take, it's on uh, way up near Steeles, it's in an office, there's a big binder full of materials, uh, you have to memorize stuff, there's maps. It is pretty much exactly the same as the sort of City of Toronto taxi course that my grandfather would have taken. And what did I learn in that course? I learned to memorize the names of the streets, the 83 or so major east-west streets in Toronto and the 47 or so north-south and the diagonal streets. 
And I'd go home to my wife and I'd say, yeah, I memorized all these streets. Ask me any street. Ask me any street. Ask me how. And she'd say, who cares? It's on my phone. Like, this, why, why does that? You're so tedious. Um, <laughs> and I said, no, no, ask me. This is like I learned this. I was, I was like, it's the first time I've been in a classroom in 20 years. And, and <laughs> I learned that much of what I was saying was of no interest to anybody. Um, but but what's, what's interesting is that as the course went on, after we got out of the geographic modules, I did learn interesting things. What do you do when you pick up a passenger in a city of Toronto taxi and the passenger is afflicted with dementia and you take it to an address and there's no one there to receive that passenger? What do you do? What is the safest way to fasten a person in a wheelchair in a disabled accessible van? What is the most dignified way to take an elderly person down an icy set of stairs if you've gone to pick them up because they have to go to a medical appointment? These are the questions that I had no idea I'd be answering, but it was actually the bulk of the useful material in the taxi course. And why are these questions important? They're important because society is aging. People are getting older. Some people are living into the 80s, 90s, into triple digits, and they're frail. Some have mental health conditions. And you wouldn't know about this massive and growing pool of people who use our taxi system, and by the way, with very few exceptions, a new city of Toronto taxi has to be disabled accessible in recognition of this fact. But you wouldn't know much about this by the people who are writing those articles about how great Uber is because they're all 25. They're talking about how great Uber is to go to a concert or a bar or a restaurant. You know, I can get as hammered as I like. I can drive back to Markham in some guy's car. It costs me 30 bucks. Uber is fantastic. That's the vision of Uber we have. And the Uber vehicles themselves cannot take the people who are old and frail and are disabled and have mental health conditions because these people don't have the app on their phone. They may not have a phone. They may have no conception of how to use Uber. Which brings me to the upshot, which is, you know, people, I wrote the article, people saw it on, on the cover, but they were too lazy to actually read it, so they say, John, what's the upshot? <laughs> what's the upshot? They'd say, Uber or taxi, what, you know, what, who, who should survive? Like, just, you know, you know give me the, the Twitter version. And I'd say, if you're 25 years old, Uber is fantastic, it's cheaper, and you're in, ultimately, you're in back of somebody's car. You don't care what color the car is. For you, Uber is the best. But if you're part of the 20 or 30% of society that maybe Uber isn't for you, maybe you're gonna be in a wheelchair, maybe you have disability issues, maybe you can't get in to uh, someone's uh, uh, two-door coupe, you need to get into a disabled accessible van, then the legacy taxi industry is of vital importance to you. And if Uber does drive the taxi industry into extinction, we're not just gonna lose a bunch of cars that may or may not smell bad. We are actually gonna lose part of our transit infrastructure, or at least transportation infrastructure. And you don't think of taxis as part of the transportation infrastructure. You think of them as little businesses on wheels. But for old people especially, they are part of the transportation industry, and our infrastructure, and how people do their groceries, and how they go to their doctor's appointments. And if that industry goes extinct, those people are still going to have to get to their doctor's appointments. Except that the people in this room are going to have to take time off work to take grandma to the doctor's appointment. Or we're going to have to pay the government to set up the infrastructure that we're losing when the taxi industry goes extinct. And the people who pay for that are the people in this room, whether you raised your hand or not. Thank you very much.